This is Nate DeMeo of the Memory Palace. I am currently the artist in residence at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This episode is one of 10 stories I will be producing for and about the Met. Now, some of these stories from the residency will be hard to follow or properly experience if you are not in the museum. This one works, I believe. You can just listen to it and enjoy it anywhere. It will definitely work if you've ever been there. You will have likely visited and will surely remember the Egyptian temple they have there in a purpose-built room with a wall of windows that looks out onto Central Park. This episode's about that place. If not, you can see images of it in the show notes to this episode, or by googling the Temple of Dender, that's Dender, D-E-N-D-U-R. In an ideal situation, you would listen to this piece while in that gallery with the temple. It doesn't matter whether you are exploring it up close or sitting off to the side or wandering around. Take it in as you will, as you listen. This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. At the start of a timeline of the history of the Temple of Dender, there's a story that goes that Caesar Augustus, the first Roman emperor, the adoptive son of Julius Caesar, after defeating Antony and Cleopatra and taking over Egypt, wanted to keep his new subjects in line. So he built a number of temples up and down the Nile to the local gods. It was a way to show the folks there that the new boss wasn't so bad. He wasn't going to force some weird new religion down their throats. And it was a show of largesse, a splash of cash on a public works project. He picked Dender, or his people picked Dender, just north of Aswan, because there was a smaller temple there already, to two princes who drowned nearby in the Nile, and had through some mechanism of belief that held sway for a relatively brief time in ancient Egypt, become gods. And so the people of Dender had been used to going to that spot already to make offerings to deities, to ask for bountiful harvests and mild flooding and healthy sons who wouldn't drown. And so the Romans signed off in that location for a modest structure, and a few years later, around 10 BC, there was this temple. Dedicated to Isis and Osiris and the two princes. And there were men there who had cut sandstone from a cliff face in a quarry, who'd carved it into blocks who dragged them across the desert, who'd hefted them on their shoulders, who were sat upon them, still warm beneath them as sunset cooled the air and a breeze shook the reeds, as they floated in a flat-bottomed boat down the Nile where two princes had once drowned and become gods. And there were men who stacked those blocks, who chiseled them into columns and lintels and falcon-faced gods, set them in place just so, sat and ate in the shade of a wall they built with those blocks. And who would think from time to time as their lives went on, and they would see the temple, see it change colors with each change of the light, or shimmer in the heat on the horizon, or see it half submerged by the Nile, flooded again. They'd see this temple and think, I built that. I was here. And tell their kids, who'd say, my father built that. He was here. Maybe their grandkids. Until eventually the Temple of Dender was just landscape and landmark. Sandstone eroding. At the next points in the timeline, the story goes that travelers, explorers, and soldiers, and wealthy dilettantes discovered the Temple of Dender over and over again. Saw it in the distance as they came around a bend in the river, as their caravans crested a hill, and they stopped for a spell, watered their horses or their camels, rested for a bit in the shade of its walls, and carved their names. You can see them there. The first one is in an ancient script. Some tagger scraped it in in like 2,000 years ago, but you can still make it out. And then there's someone named Dravetti in 1816, and in El Puliti in 1819, Leonardo, Luigi, Leandro, we don't know. But we can still almost see him there, mustachioed, sweating through wool and linen, chipping his name in the soft stone of this temple. There was an antiquities dealer, or thief, depending on how you want to look at it, from Baltimore. His name's there too. And there's a New Yorker, Louis Bradish, who came upon this minor temple on his way to see better sights. It took a few moments out of his grand tour one day in 1821 to carve his name and say to history, I was here. The story goes that the Nile flooded too high, over and over again, for millennia, 
that was the way of the Nile. And there is a point on the timeline in about 1954, when there were 23 million people in Egypt, and the flooding was brutal, and there was only one crop that year, and there was a food shortage that threatened to become a famine, but didn't quite. And so the government decided to raise the height of the Aswan Dam, and make a lake that could help irrigate enough land to ensure three crops a year, and food for those 23 million. But that lake would drown the Temple of Dender, in many other archaeological sites far more significant, hundreds of tombs and towns and forts. In Abu Simbel, the great temple of Ramses II, the one with the four seated pharaohs carved into the hillside. You know that one, I bet. The Egyptian government went to the UN, which was brand new back then, and asked the nations of the world for help. And 50 countries gave money to save it, and save as much of this history as they could. Afghanistan gave two grand. Togo, newly independent, gave $815.30 as one of its first acts on the international stage. President Kennedy went to Congress and made an impassioned speech, asking them to help preserve the antiquities and to seize their own moment in history and make their mark. And the United States donated $12 million. And that money paid for cranes and trucks and chisels and contractors and archaeologists and day laborers to dismantle and box and store as many tombs and temples as possible. Like this one here, before the waters rose and rose. There is a point on the timeline marked November 22, 1963, when a young president was shot in the back of a car and fell onto his young wife beside him and then was shot in the head while it lay on her shoulder, and he died. And then a couple of years later, after everything, after LBJ, one hand on a Bible, and one in the air on Air Force One, with Jackie beside him in the pink Chanel, still bloodstained. After Jack Ruby and Oswald, after John Jr. saluting, after all of it, the Egyptian government offered the American government a temple as a thank you for helping save so much from the flood. Other countries would get stuff too, but the United States gave the most money so it would have first pick. And the story goes that Jackie was asked to make the choice because saving the temples and the like had been a cause so dear to her late husband. That story is not entirely accurate, but that's how the story goes. And it goes on to say that she chose Dender, she chose this temple, because it was the most beautiful and Jack would have loved it the most. And what she wanted, what she wanted for this temple, what she wanted for her husband, now two years dead, was to rebuild it in Washington, D.C., amidst the faux Greco-Roman temples to Lincoln and Jefferson, the fake Egyptian obelisk that is somehow supposed to evoke Washington. She wanted to use this real temple to Isis and Osiris and to two princes who drowned too young in the river and became gods as a memorial to the man she'd once met at a dinner party at a mutual friend's place, and then fallen in love with, and set out to spend the rest of her life with, and then. The story goes that the Metropolitan Museum of Art had hired a new director. His name was Thomas Hoving. He was 36, which was remarkably young for a job like that in a place like this, especially then. But it was 1967, You can find it on the timeline there. And he was charged in part with harnessing the spirit of that age and making the Met a little less stodgy, within reason, certainly less sleepy. People who have been around the museum for a long time will tell you stories about coming here to look at art on summer afternoons when school was out, when tourists were in town, and have whole wings to themselves. And Thomas Hoving wanted to change that. He wanted crowds. Now at the same time, President Johnson was deciding what to do with this gift from Egypt. He had already ruled out Jackie's idea for a memorial. He wanted no part in deifying his predecessor. Instead, he wanted a kind of contest. He had museums and cities tell him why they thought they were the best place in America for an Egyptian temple. Not much of one, admittedly. Didn't come with any mummies or anything. Wasn't even all that old. But there were proposals from all over. The Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Smithsonian... Memphis, Tennessee, and Cairo, Illinois pitched their respective downtowns because they were named after cities in Egypt, and wouldn't that be cool? And now you, listening to this story about a temple at the Met, while maybe looking at that same temple at the Met, have a pretty good hunch how all this turns out. But the story here is that Hoving made a choice. He too knew this wasn't much of a temple. 
There were already dozens of objects in the museum's Egyptian art department far more important. He knew that it would cost a fortune to bring it here. He knew it had questionable aesthetic and historic value. But he also knew that you and I wouldn't really care. And he wanted to leave his mark on the history of the Met. He wanted to say I was here. There's a black stripe that stretches along a section of the timeline of the history of the Temple of Dender. It delineates the period of protracted competition and debate over who would get to have it. But that section is super boring, so we'll skip over it. But there's one part of that story worth telling, and we'll mark it with its own little dot. When Thomas Hoving ran into some particularly thorny obstacle in the process, he called Jackie Kennedy, who was just about to get remarried, and Hoving asked her if she could help, if she could put in a word with President Johnson on behalf of the Met. She said, and Hoving said he wrote it down word for word, I want it to be built in the center of Washington as a memorial to Jack. I don't care about the Met. I don't care about New York, she said. I don't care if the temple crumbles into sand. The story goes that the Temple of Dender sat in pieces on an island in the middle of the Nile for almost 20 years. Then it was packed up into 661 crates, sent up the river, tamed by the dam by then, and loaded onto a Norwegian freighter and borne across waves to New York. That was 1968. It sat around for nearly a decade. They built a plastic dome outside the museum where conservatives could work on it and keep it out of the elements. They were mostly waiting for a new wing to be built, in a room, here, with a high ceiling and a wall of glass looking out onto the park, made specifically to house the Temple of Dender. And then curators and teamsters and workmen brought it inside and put it back together. They are still around, a lot of them, still saying, surely, to themselves, to their kids, to their grandkids now, that they built this, that they were here. And there's another point on the timeline, another part of the story. The Times wrote it up. One day they were rebuilding the temple, scaffolding and hard hats, ancient dust catching the light through the windows. And work just stopped. Because Jackie Onassis and her daughter Caroline, who was just about to turn 18, came into the room. Jackie lived a block away. It was 1975. It had been 12 years since her husband had been shot in the head while it lay on her shoulder. The Times didn't record what she said, or know what she felt, of course, just that she looked around a while and signed autographs to the workers. And the timeline stretches on, with a point marking the opening reception in 1978. Champagne flutes, wide lapels, there's a point placed at Hoving's death in 2009. Dender is mentioned right near the top of his obituary. There are new placards on the wall opposite the park. The old ones had yellowed with age. We'll mark a point for their arrival. The curators are very proud of them. They are filled with all sorts of details that will help the curious visitor place this temple in its proper historical context. To understand what distinguishes it, built as it was in the so-called Roman period, 30 BC to 640 AD, from temples of earlier epics, those epics traditionally being distinguished by various things. There's a point for the teachers telling school groups the story, explaining how this minor temple comes from the tail end of what we think of as ancient Egypt, the golden sarcophaguses and mummies and stuff, a time when the old gods were on their way out, and explain that we are closer in time to its construction, right now, by almost 500 years than the construction of the pyramids and the Sphinx were to the men who built this temple and sat in its shade. But you can just tell that the story, when the kids get home, will be, Mom, I saw the place where they put the mummies. And good for them. Mark a point for the night when one of those kids sleeps and dreams of Dender. Mark a point for the selfie taken at arm's length. The tourist saying, I was here. Another for the security guard saying, no flash, please, for the gajillionth time that day. One for the toddler eyeing the pool with the papyrus, 
with his parents warning him away, lest he be drowned and deified. Mark a point for each change in the light, and how they change how the 